Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you very much. My name is Ted and I'm an alcoholic. Uh, it has been by the grace of God and with the help of the people and the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I've met a drink in 10 years, 6 months, 19 days, and I'm very, very grateful for that. I want appreciate very much the consideration and kindness that you have extended to my wife and to myself. To the flowers that uh, you brought to my wife at the airport, she really loved them. They didn't give me any. <laughs> I brought y'all a uh, inspirational message. This has got Bible verses in it, so I'll have to read it. The subject of this is Judge Not. It says, The preacher knocked on the door of a church member, but received no response. He was annoyed, annoyed because he could hear footsteps and knew that the mother of the family was there. The pastor left his calling card writing on the back of it, Revelations 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man can hear my noise and open the door, I will come in to him. The next Sunday, as the parishioners filed out of the service, the woman who had refused to answer the door greeted the pastor and handed him her card, and it had Genesis 3.10 written on it. Later, the pastor looked up the passage and found the following, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. say up here is guesswork. I really don't remember much of what I did when I was drinking because I was drinking, and I don't remember much of what I did when I wasn't drinking because I wasn't drinking. <laughs> My first thoughts that I can remember were resentments. I looked around. And I could for not, not, I couldn't for the life of me figure out why I couldn't have all the money I wanted, all the approval I wanted, all the sex I wanted, all the power I wanted. Why in the world would a world be put together where you couldn't have everything you wanted? That wasn't right. And it wasn't right that it wasn't right. I tried to straighten it out so I could get what I wanted, but they wouldn't listen. They retaliated. They put me down, and I resented that. Everywhere I went, people left. I said, there they go. I must pursue them. <laughs> For I am their leader. <laughs> I said to hell with it. I'll resign from the human race. I effectively isolated myself from God and from my fellow man. It was a particularly bad decision. <laughs> Guilt ate me alive. I was restless, I was irritable, and I was discontented. I had to drink a long time before I had to drink. 
And before I ever took a drink, I had completely cut people out of my life, completely unable to have relations. Solitude was safer, more comfortable, and less risky. When I got to AA, I did not know five people that I had gone to school with. I did not know the date of my marriage. I did not know how old my wife was. I didn't know how old my children were. I didn't know what grade they were in in school. I did not remember five people that I had gone to school with. I did not remember five people that I had had for clients in over 20 years of practicing law. So far as I can recall, I had never given anyone that I ever knew five minutes of my time. Never had. I was aware, painfully aware, of only one thing in this world, me and what me wanted. Everywhere I went, my complaint was the same. Is this all there is? <laughs> if I could have been anywhere near honest, it would have been, is this all there is for me? I never could seem to find what I didn't know I was looking for. <laughs> and I figured I was in the wrong place with the wrong people at the wrong time with the wrong me. And I began anxiously searching, looking for the magic world where I belong, where everything was just the way it was supposed to be, that is, just the way that I wanted. Two character defects have plagued me, perfectionism and procrastination. <laughs> There's no use doing anything today because today things just aren't right. But someday when everything gets just right, that is when they get just the way they're supposed to be, that is the way, just the way I want them, why then I'll do something. <laughs> but on a daily basis, I simply could not, I would not get involved in life. I did the least I could that would just barely get me by, and that always left me with a lot of potential. My God, they always, they always told me about that potential. But you know, the truth of the matter is that if you only do what you want to do, and never do anything that you don't want to do, you're always going to have a lot of potential, aren't you? <laughs> but someday things were going to be different. I was going to figure this thing out. I was going to be on top. I was going to be a success. People would be sorry that they hadn't seen this vast potential that lay beating fiercely just beneath my timid breast. <laughs> and though they mistreat me now, Someday I would forgive them. <laughs> One and all, someday. But someday always seemed like such a long, long way off. And I was a very impatient person. And I'd take a drink just like that. It was someday. I was in charge and I was in control for the only time in my life. I was comfortable. And living in someday, but wanting what I wanted today, I had only such principles as self-will run right would allow, or such principles as I could convince you that I had. And that wasn't any, really. I tried to adopt your principles, your way of living, by doing things that I thought would please you. And my plan of action went like this. I'll call attention to myself. If people like me, then they won't hurt me, and I'll feel better. But I got tired of trying to please all you dummies, and I rebelled against that. I tried religion as a way of life. I went to the church the First Baptist Church. <laughs> they called me Brother Ted. 
I was dipped and I was dunked. <laughs> but it didn't work. All I could see was this guy standing up here, something like this, where I am. He'd be behind this podium, and he'd be saying things like this. Friends, there's coming a day. It's going to be here soon. It's going to be here when you least expect it. It's going to be a final day. It's going to be a judgment day. And they're going to haul your butt up in front of this wide screen, and they're going to flash back on there every rotten, lousy, filthy, miserable, despicable thing you ever did in all your life. And I didn't feel too good. And I got the idea in church that you had to feel bad in order to be good. I just see all the dummies sitting around there watching the screen. They're flashing old kid up there. They don't know their turns coming up next. And they're all, they're all sitting there saying, shame, shame, shame. Preacher asked me here not long ago, he says, Ted, how come you keep going to those AA meetings after you stop drinking? And I said, I guess, preacher, for the same same reason that your flock keeps coming every Sunday after you save them. <laughs> I tried doing just what I wanted to do. I do just what I felt like doing. But that didn't work. I had taken all my feelings. And I had smashed them down inside of me deep so that nobody could get at me anymore. And when you try to live on these kind of feelings, well, you're going to be crazy as hell. And I was. I was just crazy as hell. I'd be sitting in my chair, and the knives and the furniture would be whizzing by my head. And I would look at this crazy, demented wife of mine... Pitying me, knowing that it was driving her crazy because I would not react to what she was doing. <laughs> I sat there sulking in silent scorn. She said I smirked at her. I tried success as a way of life. I was a judge, I was a lawyer, I had money in the bank, I was high on the social register. I had charge accounts at every liquor store in Texas City and Lamarck and one in Galveston. That's success. But that didn't work either. I guess the best thing or the best way that you could describe my life before I got to Alcoholics Anonymous would be to say, I almost made it. Everything I ever did, I almost Alcohol was an almost. When I drank it, I was happy, I was joyous, and I was free sometimes. And any drug, I don't care what it is, any drug that can give you freedom, even sometimes, is a powerful, powerful, powerful drug. But something was still wrong. It didn't last. It was temporary. It wasn't real. It wasn't real. But without it, man, I was a nothing. I was a dope. I was a sap. But with it, I was magnificent. I was witty. I was charming. And I was suave. My God, I've always hungered for suavity. I drank until I could not drink anymore. I mean, I couldn't drink anymore. But I kept on drinking anyway. <laughs> I tried many ways to control my drinking or to stop my drinking. And being a smart aleck college graduate, I went about it in the same way that I did everything else. I read books. And as a result of reading these books, I started jogging. They said it worked in Switzerland. 
I got a pair of the shortest shorts I could find and run around the block. See those Venetian blinds shake because I knew those housewives would be watching. <laughs> and I tried yoga. I tried transcendental meditation. But all I could meditate on was why the jogging and the yoga wouldn't work for me. I tried psychology. They said, I read in college that if you go far enough back into your youth and found out what was bugging you and bring this to light, that this would free you. And I went back and found out I had a lot of hate. I wasn't okay. By God, none of you were either. I had a troubled childhood. It's been a long one. Tried psychology. Guy said I had a bad behavior problem. Said stay away from the people that you drank with. Stay away from the places that you drank. This will break your behavior pattern and you won't have to drink anymore. Stay away from all the places that I drank. Stay away from all the people that I drank with. And it worked for a while. Of course, everything I did worked for a while. I was a periodic drunk. Then one day I woke up and I hadn't been around any of the people that I drank with or any of the places that I drank, but I didn't care. I just went ahead and drank anyway. It didn't make any sense to me. I read two books by Dr. Valdez at the Veterans Hospital in Houston. He said I had a bad hypothalamus. This is a gland up in the middle of the brain, and he says this thing just starts titillating, just goes berserk when you get ready to drink. And he intimated if I would have a brain operation and have my hypothalamus removed that I'd be able to drink like everybody else, and I was beginning to think by this time that I needed a brain operation. <laughs> I got the reading on about the hypothalamus, and I found out that it also controlled appetite and sex. <laughs> At that time, I was not willing to go to any lengths to get sober, so I didn't get the operation. <laughs> I read a marvelous book by Dr. Tintera. He said I had bad adrenaline glands. And that I needed adrenaline cortex extract to straighten me out. And I went to the doctor and he said, this is a large dose. It's going to be painful. And I said, no pain is too great to return to social drinking. <laughs> he shot me in the rear end and the only effect that it had on me was that I had to stand up when I drank. That's all. I took glutamine and tycopan, as recommended in two books by a University of Texas chemistry professor. I used to down these with alcohol because there were so many pills. I tried an abuse, and all it did was make my eyeballs red. I tried health foods. I tried diets. I read somewhere that you'd drink an ounce of alcohol an hour, night, and day for the rest of your life and never harm you. I say, my God, where's this information been? This is a thing I've been looking for all my life. I'll drink an ounce of alcohol an hour. I went to the bar, ordered a drink. I finished the drink in 10 minutes. 50 minutes to go to the next drink. <laughs> I said, well, what I'll do, I have the next hour's drink now when the next hour gets there. <laughs> that didn't work. But I thought these things were working. And I used to go up and down the streets of Texas City and Lamarck telling all my friends, why don't you do like I do? Stop drinking. It's wonderful. It's great. Work better. Feel better. Everything is fine. And I began to thinking that began to think that I could help people that had alcohol problems, had drinking problems. I was doing twelve step work before I ever got to AA. <laughs> and I've always had these delusions of grandeur, these fantasies. And I could just see myself up on a high hill somewhere, and I would be dressed in these white robes. And they would be gently shifting in the breezes. And I would be surrounded by multitudes and multitudes of people all laid out before me. A veritable sea of humanity. And there would be this strange, eerie, haunting melody from afar and yet so near. Seemed like it was Rock of Ages. And I would rise. And you have to have a certain air when you address multitudes. 
And I would give them this message. Tired and weary, desperate and hopeless, want a new and better way of life. Oh, come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. For thine yoke is heavy, while its mine is light. Yea, and verily I say unto thee, go, my children, and drink no more. I was a crazy son of a bitch when I got to Icarus Mountain. <laughs> of all my resentment, my chief resentment was that no one had appointed me God. Every time I stopped drinking, I always left a reservation. I said, now, this is absolutely, positively, without a doubt. I mean it this time. King Jackson, take a lock all the way around. The last time I'm going to take a drink, that's it. Unless maybe something comes up real bad later on. (laughs) That just makes it absolutely necessary. (laughs) Something always did. I tried AA without trying AA. I was campaigning for judge there in Texas City and Lamarck, and I ran across Sam Harkins, an old-time AA member, and this guy was always asking me to go to an AA meeting for some reason. (laughs) And he said, well, Teddy says, since you're campaigning for judge, he says, we're having a conference here in Texas City of Alcoholics. And why don't you come over there and pass your cards out and get their votes? Well, I didn't think these kind of people voted. (laughs) But I wasn't willing to let any opportunity go by, so I went over there and I said, My name is Ted Bishop. I'm running for judge. You folks are doing fine work here. Keep up the good work. And I had a special campaign slogan for the ladies. I would say, ladies, before you go to bed, think of Ted. (laughs) I lost the election. (laughs) I'd been drinking with a millionaire there in Texas City. He was the fellow I was trying to get his law business. He was the wealthiest man in Texas City, and he had a bad drinking problem, and I, I was his drinking buddy. He drank a lot worse than I did. Everybody I drank with drank a lot worse than I did. <laughs> I made a I made a, a meeting of the 518 group in Texas City, where Sam Harkins was, and I told Sam, I said, Now, Sam, you're probably wondering what I'm doing down here. Said, you remember I made that anniversary when I was campaigning for judge, and I've been elected judge now. And as a part of trying to help others, I'm here to behalf, on behalf of this wealthy businessman. He's too ashamed to come down here, but I'm here for him. And do you have any literature that I might take to him? And Sam gave me a big book. And I stayed for the meeting. I took the big book home and I read it. And it looked a little bit churchy to me. So I took it over to this fellow that I was drinking with. His name was Billy. He wasn't there, and his wife was. I said, Mert, this is the book that those drunks used to sober up with down there at AA. So I took time out from my busy schedule to go down there for your husband. And I'm sure that he could use this book, and it would probably help him. And she said, well, how much is the book? And I said, oh, they had a small book down there, and it was five ninety-five. but this is the big book, and it's $10. <laughs> I bought two-fifths of Canadian Club with the 10 bucks. I tried to put the money in the plate later on, 
I mean, I tried to give the money to Mert later on, but she wouldn't take it. She said the book was well worth it, so I had to put the money in the plate. So there I was. Uh, I had gone to these two meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. And right after this, Billy showed up at my office. And he had been out on a bender, and he wanted me to sober him up. Well, I didn't think that my ways were going to work for him. I was really beginning to doubt that they were going to work for me. I had been to these two meetings, and I, I really I wanted to get back to AA. There had been something there. But I just couldn't. You know, I was a judge, and I was a lawyer, high on the social register. So there was no legitimate way for me to get back to AA. So what I did, I conned Billy into going to Alcoholics Anonymous so that I could go along with him as his friend and as his advisor. <laughs> and as an example for all of you. And that's the way I got started going to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I made a lot of AA meetings. I wanted to sober Billy up. His wife told me that she would give me half of everything they had if I sobered him up. <laughs> and he was a very, very wealthy man. So I was going to AA every night. Now, you know, a lot of people say they didn't like AA when they got to AA. But, you know, I just love AA. You know, if you're not really an alcoholic, and you're going to AA meetings, you know, you can walk around those meetings and you can just be superior as hell to everybody in there. <laughs> and I just love to go to those things. And I'd go down there, and sometimes they'd call on me to talk. I'd say, my name is Ted Bishop. I'm a judge and I'm a lawyer. My law street is about five blocks down the street there. My law hours are nine to five, and I want you to know that I appreciate having an organization like this where a judge like myself can send people like you who need this kind of help. God bless you, and I'd sit down. And other times they'd call on me to talk, and I could see that these people didn't understand alcoholism very well, and I had read so much about it, and I'd get up and I'd explain alcoholism to everybody. First stage, second stage, third stage, primary, secondary, everything that didn't have a thing in the world to do with recovery, why, well, that's what I was telling them. Newcomers thought I made great talk. Man, they used to line up and shake my hand. Old-timers, they didn't say a word to me. <laughs> I figured they were jealous because I had gotten it all together so quickly and was putting it across so much better than any of them could. I've been coming to these meetings about four months, and I got one of these big cards in the mail, and I opened this thing up, and it was this dog, Snoopy, in the peanuts column. And Snoopy had Woodstock, and all the little ducks lined up there in front of him. He was laying on him. I mean, he really had a message. He had his aviator outfit on, and the caption on this thing said, if you can't dazzle him with your brilliance, Baffle him with your bullshit. <laughs> it was unsigned. <laughs> and I kept on coming to these meetings, and, and the people started looking at me kind of funny. I'm not an AA. I'm just going to AA. And these people are looking at me funny, and I can see what it was. Looked like Billy was doing all right, yet here I am still coming to all these AA meetings. And I could see that I was going to need a little bit more cover. So what I did, I started sentencing people to Alcoholics Anonymous from my courtroom. And that way, I had to go down to these meetings not only to see that Billy was there, but I had to go down to see that all the people that I sent to Alcoholics Anonymous was there. And I used to go down to these meetings, and I had a little black book that I carried over here in this pocket. And I would walk up and down the aisles of this group, and I would check off the names of the people that I had sent to Alcoholics Anonymous. 
I would say, are you here? Are you here? If you don't make these beatings, I'm going to have to issue a warrant for your arrest. I was single-handedly building up the membership of a group that had been faltering badly until I arrived on the scene. And I had them doing yoga, and I had people in there doing jogging, and I was selling them vitamin pills. I'd buy them for $5 and sell them to them for 10 I like to do things my way. But I made a rare mistake. I went to a conference with Sam and Celia, his wife, the Lone Star Roundup of 1974 in Dallas, Texas. And I figured that they were taking me up to this thing as a judge so I could explain to everybody how us judges were sending everybody to AA. And I went up there ready to talk. I got up there and I didn't get to say anything. I had to sit around and listen to all these other drunks talk. Man, I got tired of that. We were sitting up in the room about the second day and they were talking about this being a program of attraction rather than promotion. And I saw a chance for my star to shine. I said, now, wait a minute. Hold on just a minute. I said, what we need is a nationwide campaign of publicity. Put it in all the newspapers, radio, TV. Get full press coverage. And everybody will know about Alcoholics Anonymous. Judges like myself will be able to send everybody to AA. And everybody will be in Alcoholics Anonymous. And this CEO, Sam's wife, this Al-Anon, <laughs> Al-Anon me, <laughs> there was a bunch of people sitting in this room where I wouldn't have been spouting off in the first place, and she said, Judge, just why are you coming to Alcoholics Anonymous in the first place? And I said, well, I'm coming to see that Billy comes, and I'm coming to see that all these people I sent to Alcoholics Anonymous come. She says, I think you're coming to Alcoholics Anonymous because you are attracted here to Alcoholics Anonymous. And the reason that you are attracted here, Judge, is because you are an alcoholic. <laughs> that was very embarrassing. I'm a very sensitive type person. <laughs> and Sam, this pipe fitter, said very quietly, he said, Judge, in front of all these people, he said, I guess you'll just have to go down and get a chip like all the rest of us did. Oh, it was embarrassing. <laughs> and I excused myself just as quickly as I could, and I went back to my room, and I got in bed, and I've sweated some when I drank, but nothing like that night. The sweat just poured out of me. And I tossed and I turned. Fifteen minutes I was an alcoholic. Fifteen minutes I wasn't. Fifteen minutes I was an alcoholic. Fifteen minutes I wasn't. But the thing that really worried me was I thought, what if I go down there, pick up a chip, join Alcoholics Anonymous, and then ten years later, it turns out I'm not really an alcoholic. <laughs> ten years completely gone out of my life. <laughs> but I didn't have anything else to do. I wasn't drinking. If you're not drinking, what difference does it make what you do? Just well go on down there with a bunch of sloppy old miserable drunks and be miserable with them. So I went down, down to a small group where I didn't think any of them would be, and I picked up a chip. Absolutely convinced that my life was over. And you know what? It was. Because life did not commence for me until I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. 
Well, I did some drinking. I didn't mention that. I guess I better tell you that I did do a little bit of drinking. I did some of my worst drinking while I was a justice of the peace in Texas City and Lamarck from 1967 through 1978. And as justice of the peace, I used to marry a lot of people. But I had a problem there. Sometimes I'd be drinking when the people would come to get married. But I solved that. I was officing with a real estate man, and I taught him the marriage ceremony. <laughs> so if people came to me to get married, and I was drunk, he'd perform the ceremony. <laughs> There's a lot of sinners running around Texas City and Lamarck. <laughs> this very moment. I also had the job of coroner. If somebody died, I had to go pronounce them dead. I went to this house one night, and I pronounced this person dead, and they moved the person into the bedroom, and they all went outside. They called the ambulance. I passed out in the living room. <laughs> I woke up in the ambulance dead. <laughs> and I was a cute drunk. When I was able to marry people, I'd say, now, nah, I hope that this marriage was made in heaven. Same time, I'm a little older and I'm a little wiser than you. And in case this thing don't work out, why, here's my attorney at law card. <laughs> and then the people who had been married by the real estate man would come to my court and they'd say, you're not the judge, because they'd been married by the real estate man. <laughs> About two years before I came to AA, another drunk and I decided that we needed a hair transplant. I thought my hair was getting a little thin up here on top, and I didn't want all the ladies to lose their interest in me. So we went up to Pasadena, and I guess they told me they would give me 20 plugs at $5 a plug. That's $100 for a luxurious head of hair. And what they do, they take these little nippers, and they cut these round things out of your nut back of your neck, and then they dig holes up here on the top of your head, and they plant these things up here on the top of your head. And I stand here before you tonight with 20 plugs <laughs> right around the back of my head. And you see, I have this fear that someday all my hair is going to fall out and these 20 plugs are just going to be standing straight up. <laughs> <laughs> now they tell me that they can get this hair from any part of the body. <laughs> but I want everybody here to know that mine came from the back of my neck. Here I am in AA. First night in AA. I was not impressed with your cornball signs. I was not enchanted with your great thoughts and your beautiful poetry. And I didn't want to hear about God. I thought that you were the luckiest people in the world to have a wonderful fellow like me consent to join up with you. I was absolutely convinced that you needed me but that I did not need you. I had a bad attitude. <laughs> Tell you the kind of guy I was. Have you ever asked a doctor or a lawyer a question and just have him look at you like you weren't there? This is why he sit up on the bench like this. They'd be down there below me. 
Maybe some of y'all have been before a judge sometime, charged with something. You know what that means when a judge looks down on you like that? Huh? That means you're a dumb bastard. <laughs> and I am Mr. Wonderful. And that was my attitude when I got to AA. I ran around and I say, how does this thing work? And they say, utilize, don't analyze. And I say, how am I going to utilize it unless I analyze to see what it is I'm supposed to utilize? They said, it's not going to be necessary, so we'll tell you what to do. That's what I was trying to avoid. I had a meeting one time, this guy says, in order to stop drinking, it is first necessary that you stop drinking. I never heard that anywhere. And that being in those, in those books I read, I go ask this guy, and I says, how does this thing work? How do you not get drunk? He says, don't take the first drink. And you won't get drunk. That's intellectually insulting. I went to a guy who had more time than he did, and I said, how does this thing work? How do you have to get drunk? And he says, you just don't take the first train, and you won't get drunk. Well, I could see that these old goose had been around so long, they forgot what it was like to drink. They didn't understand this thing themselves. So what I'd do, I'd go out, and I'd find out how this thing worked, and then I'd come back and I'd tell all them. They'd be glad to know. So I went out and ordered a drink. I had my legal pad with me. I said, I now have the first drink. It's nine, ten, ten minutes. I finished this drink. I'm not drunk. I feel good. It's not the first drink that gets you drunk. Therefore, what I'll do is have, is have one more first drink. <laughs> and I had to come crawling back to Alcoholics Anonymous, I guess so that I could bring you this spiritual message tonight, and that is this, if you don't take the first drink, <laughs> you see, I always said, no, 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 you've got to understand how not to drink, and then you cannot drink. And while you're finding out how not to drink, you can keep on finding out how not to while you're finding out. That didn't come out right. <laughs> and it never did when I was thinking it either. <laughs> but you know, there's something about this understanding before I do something that has always messed me up in alcoholics. No. I always thought that I had to, had to understand it before I could do it. But you know, our twelfth step says, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. And I guess that's the previous eleven. So how am I going to understand something if I have never spiritually awakened? It's just like being asleep. I don't really know what happened while I was asleep. I'm not I do not know uh, that I had a dream until I wake up the next day, and then I know what happened while I was asleep. And so when I become spiritually awake in Alcoholics Anonymous, then I am able to understand what went on, but not until I'm spiritually awakened. And I must try to maintain and keep on with my program of Alcoholics Anonymous lest I go spiritually asleep again. Because when I am asleep, my defenses are at their lowest. I'm most vulnerable to attack and to other people when I am asleep. Well, anyway, I got to watching you drunks. And I could see that you all had similar characteristics. You were alike in an amazing number of ways. I've always had this thing. I guess it was God-given talent. I've always been able to tell what other people's faults were. And it seemed like I was supposed to always tell them about it, because I always did. 
And I made a list. I called it the BBB of AAA. That's the Bishop Big Book of the Association of Alcoholics Anonymous. This is in the form of questions. My questions, you don't have to answer if you understand them, why you may be one. Why is an alcoholic always thinks that he's the most unusual, the most unique, and the most important person in all the world? Why is an alcoholic can't be shown anything? A old drunk and I were sitting there at Christmas, we were working on the camera, and I said, here, let me show you. And he grabbed it back and said, here, let me show you. And he grabbed it back and said, here, let me show you. And my wife, Margaret, sitting down here at the Allen Island, she came in. She said, here, let me show both of you and fixed it with a pen. Why does an alcoholic can't take directions from anybody? Any of you wives ever, ever try to tell your old drunk husbands where to turn on the road? Why does an alcoholic always think that he is entitled to continuous and extra excitement? And if things get a little bit slow, he'll go look for the biggest pile he can find, the one that's going to stink the most, and he'll start stirring. You watch him. Why does an alcoholic always think that the other fellow had not got the least idea of what he's talking about? Why does an alcoholic always hate Christmas and get that queasy feeling every time they get a gift or a compliment? Why does an alcoholic always say, leave me alone, just leave me alone, but can't stand to be left alone? Why does an alcoholic is never, 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 never in this world satisfied? There is absolutely no way. Why is an alcoholic keeps on making the same old mistakes time after 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 time? Why is an alcoholic always hates drunk? But always manages to get drunk himself. Why is an alcoholic won't ask for help and hates even worse to accept it? Why is an alcoholic must always have everything his way, right down to the smallest, most infinitesimal detail? Why is an alcoholic hates to stand in line or wait for anything? Why is an alcoholic just sits around waiting for something bad to happen? That I know it's going to happen. It's going to be bad, too. When's it going to be? When's it going to be? It's going to be bad. Why an alcoholic? Fine. They're always fine. You ever see them? How you doing, Joe? Fine. Just fine. How are you, Bill? I'm fine. Just fine. They're dying and they're just fine. I ain't go to one of these funerals where they got one of these drunks laid out and they got that casket open. I'm afraid to walk by there and look in. I'm afraid he's going to sit up and say, I'm fine. You ever get that feeling? <laughs> and why is it that no matter what you say to an alcoholic, no matter what you do to an alcoholic, it is inevitable, inevitable that he is going to drink again unless a miracle occurs in his life. I took your inventory is what I did. There wasn't any need to take mine. I wasn't really an alcoholic. Now, I might have been a textbook alcoholic, or I might have been a borderline alcoholic, or I might have been on the edge of being an alcoholic, or I might have been slightly alcoholic, or a little bit alcoholic, or almost alcoholic, or barely alcoholic, or just about alcoholic, or if I kept on drinking, I was going to be an alcoholic, but I wasn't really an alcoholic, not really. And if you're not really, really an alcoholic, then you're not really an alcoholic. <laughs> Even if I was, I was a lot better one than you were. <laughs> People stopped me. The police stopped me. They put me in jail. They'd take me home. I'd, I'd go home 
I'd get up about two o'clock in the morning, run down to Lamarck Jail. They have an old drunk dentist down there. Say, Judge, what do you want to do with this dentist? We got him in here again. This guy came to AA later. You want to cut him loose? I'd say, no, nah, leave that son of a bitch in there. <laughs> He's a bad drunk. Then I'd go out to my car and I'd get a pint from under my seat and I'd take a drink. But you can see the difference. He was in jail. <laughs> I was out. He paid a fine, and I collected it. <laughs> so I was different, right? I was different. I'm still looking for this answer in AA. I had a lot of brain damage when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, I want to tell you. I really did. I looked up on the wall right in the middle of the meeting. I saw it. I jumped straight up there and I said, look, look, there it is, the answer to Alcoholics Anonymous. You know what it was? It was this sign that says, thank, thank, thank. <laughs> it was different from all those other signs. Easy does it, first things first. It was unusual. It was unique. It wasn't in the big book. All those other signs had letters the same size. But this one had a little thing on top, a great big thing in the middle, and a little thing on the bottom. It read the same from top to bottom as bottom to top. Thank, thank, thank. And I got to look at that thing, and I got to meditating on it, and I know whether I was supposed to have a little thing, and then a great big thing, and another little thing, or whether I was supposed to have a big thing in the middle and two outside little thing. And I got to thinking about that thing, and I couldn't think what the hell it was I was thinking about. That damn sign almost got me drunk. <laughs> People in AA started noticing my attitude. And they started giving me things to do in Alcoholics Nam. Well, I didn't have anything to do. I wasn't drinking. What difference did it make? I'd go to all these AA dances, and I didn't even dance when I was drunk. Every time somebody in our group went to the hospital, I had to go to the hospital and visit them. I never visited anybody in the hospital unless it was a slip of bread or a pint right under the doctor's nose. Every time somebody died in the group, I had to go to the funeral. I never went to funerals unless I had a pint hit out somewhere. The guy's dead, he's dead. He don't know whether you're at his funeral or not. That time I come down there and said, we want you to go around, shake everybody's hand, and ask them how they're doing. I said, I've got a better idea. I always had a better idea. I said, I'll stand up here at the front of the room. When people come in, they can come up to me and shake their hand. I'll shake their hand. I'm a Democratic judge. They said, no, we want you to go around to each person in this room and ask them how they're doing. Sobriety starts with you doing something and not sitting around waiting for somebody to do something to you. And I had to go around and shake all these people saying, how are you, how are you, how are you, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but the thing they did to me that really, oh, it really split my bridges. I had to go around and I had to visit at the homes of the members of our group. I'd go in there and they'd say, do you think it's going to rain? Like I was a damn weatherman or something. <laughs> They'd say, little Billy started kindergarten today, and, and I'd say, the hell he did, you know? <laughs> hey, here's a winner. How much was your electric bill this month? Would you like to see my children's pictures and their children's pictures and their grandchildren's pictures? Oh, hell yeah. Let me see them all. <laughs> I was really with it. I was really with it. We have a stepson, Margaret's boy. Penitentiary twice. Drugs. Mud houses over and over and over again. Every time I ran for office, 
His picture was on the front page of the local paper. <laughs> Judge's son picked up in local drug raid. Oh, I resented that boy. No, oh, it was terrible. Terrible. He finally ended up in the Graves Building in Galveston, which is the local nut ward. We got a letter from the psychiatrist, and he said that uh, this boy's brain had been damaged to such an extent by the use of drugs that he would never function normally as a human being, hold a job, and all that kind of stuff. And Margaret and myself and I really don't know how Margaret was able to do this. I think it's one of the miracles of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. We put this boy out on the streets, and two years later he sobered up in Alcoholics Anonymous. How about that? And he's had varying periods of sobriety in, in AA, and he's getting close to a year now. And we're very grateful for his sobriety in Alcoholics Anonymous. I've been coming to AA about four months when I picked up a chip. And the night that I came to AA, Billy asked me to be his sponsor. That's the way I've been in AA ever since. I was in AA five minutes, and I was sponsoring somebody with four months of sobriety. And I swore that he would never, ever take another drink ever again as long as he lived, and he never did. And I told him how to work this thing, and four months later, he went home, he took a 12-gauge shotgun, and he blew the top of his head off. And when they called me and they told me what had happened, you know what I, I said? I said, how can this guy do this to me after all I've done for him? What are people going to think of me now? I couldn't save him. Resentment and fear every time I try to play God. It always happens. And I was at the uh, honorary pallbearer the next day. And I really didn't feel like an honorary pallbearer. Uh, I was walking along behind that casket, and I hated my guts bad. And I came to the meeting that night, and uh, I felt something. And I hadn't felt anything in, in a long time. Uh, I was, I could see that these people were concerned that Billy's death was going to get me drunk. And I was grateful to them. And I had never been grateful to anybody for anything for as long as I can remember. But I felt grateful to those people tonight, that night. I have told you essentially a story of self-will run riot. I wrote the play, I set the stage, I was the writer, I was the producer, I was the director, and I was the star. I was going to go to AA and find out how to drink and get Billy's money and be successful forever. But it didn't turn out that way. Instead, we all ended up going to Billy's funeral. They told me that the root of my problem was selfishness and self-centeredness. It took me a long, long time to buy that in Alcoholics Anonymous, I'll tell you that. But what it was, I wanted what I wanted. I wanted it the way I wanted. I wanted all that I wanted. And I always wanted it on my terms. Always on my terms. And in trying to get what I wanted, I tried to satisfy my fears of not getting what I wanted on my terms term. The root of my problem is selfishness and self-centeredness. My problem is fear. I drank because I was afraid. I was afraid because I was full of self. All those years, I felt superior to you. I was the king in this world of self. I felt inferior to you because I simply could not hack reality. 
Bill Wilson said, recovery from alcoholism is simple, but it is not easy. There is a price that must be paid. And it meant the destruction of self-centeredness. We must turn in all things to the Father of life. But I found that I could not turn my will and my life over to the care of God by turning my will and my life over to the care of God. I'll tell you what happened to me. I went to AA as a judge and as an example for you. I would send people to Alcoholics Anonymous and then I would go down there and I would sponsor them. I had pigeons on the right. I had pigeons on the left. I always had my coffee hot delivered to me. And I floated along this way in Alcoholics Anonymous for a long, long time. I was working the 13th step, 1 and 12. I wasn't drinking, and I was helping others. And this went on for me a long, long time in Alcoholics Anonymous. And then one day something happened. I got a resentment at somebody in Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't even know what it was. I'd never had one before. And all of a sudden, I started developing all these fears. And I had never been afraid of anything in my life. Didn't need to be. I had alcohol. Didn't need resentment. I had alcohol. I would go to the courthouse in Galveston, take papers to file, and stay all day long, terrified. I wouldn't put that something was wrong with the papers. I would come back to my office and go back to Galveston and spend all the next day doing the same thing. I was afraid to answer the phone, afraid to go to the post office, certified mail, return receipt, terrified me. And this is what five years in Alcoholics Anonymous did for me. And the pain got so bad that I had to do something. I did what you did. I took an inventory. And I will share with you a summary of that inventory that I took. What it was, you see, was I had this terrible fear that I was unlovable. And it so terrified me that I took it and I drove it deep, 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 hoping and praying to God that it would never, ever again see the light of day. And it was only through Alcoholics Anonymous that I was able to reach down and find these feelings that I had placed so far within me. And I'm really, really grateful for that. Alcoholics Anonymous, the program of AA, AA Love, for me, involves the use of the will and not the emotion. Feeling better is not getting better. And I had to ask myself some questions. What have I done to be a lovable person? Not for what I can get from you, but for what I can get from me. And is it really God's will for me to run around being right about everything? And I had to come to the conclusion in Alcoholics Anonymous that I had been wrong about everything. Everything. It looked like I could have been right about something. My complaint always was, why can't I belong? Why can't I be a part of? Where's my magic world? Where's my land? Where's the place that I'm supposed to be? There's a tradition in Alcoholics Anonymous that says, the only requirement for membership in Alcoholics Anonymous is a desire to stop drinking. And I believe that the only requirement for membership in the human race is a, require, is a desire to become a member of the human race. 
And all those some days that I were looking for are never going to get here. Someday is a lie. Because even if someday, someday gets here, it's not going to be someday. It's just going to be today. Today is someday. I make amends to you for using the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I regret that. But I know better today, and I feel that when you know better, you do better. But you see, I believe that my character defect was not that I used the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. My character defect was that I thought that that was what I should do to get what I wanted. And it was the only thing I knew to do. My defects lie in my bad thinking and my attitude and my opinion. AA was made just for me. God knew I had a problem, old screwed up teddy bear. <laughs> and he sent me Billy. And he sent me 518 group, and he sent me Sam, and he sent me Celia, and he sent me all of you. God must think I'm a pretty special person. I don't understand God. But when I'm right with you, and I'm right with me, then I feel like I know God. Thank you a lot. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.